A fresh wave of ETF applications, but this time for Ethereum? While Base, the layer 2 solution by Coinbase starts to make the rounds. Launching on August 9th. We discuss all this right now in Collective Shift's weekly recap, actionable insights, and a breakdown into the market just for you, all in under 30 minutes. As always, we'll start with the market update, followed by the new ETF applications. Matt, take it away with the market. What can I say, Leon? Another flat week for crypto. Uh, sound like a broken engine in 2023 so far, but everything is coiling up. You can feel sort of the pressure, the frustration in the market. Uh, the traders are even very frustrated at the moment. You can feel the tension. Um, I'm sure there's going to be an event sooner or later where we see some volatility to the upside or downside. Okay, so just how <laughs> just how flat are we? You know, how, how flat is flat? I think to really put it in context, right, what we're talking about here is low volatility, really just meaning the prices aren't going up much to the upside or to the downside. That's been the case for most of 2023 so far, very sort of uncharacteristic for Bitcoin and, and all of crypto, which is traditionally traditionally seen as a very you know high risk and very volatile asset. Uh, there were times in late Jan, uh, late July, so just you know last week, two weeks ago, where Bitcoin's five day volatility was below that of the S and P five hundred, one of the largest, if not the largest, sort of stock index in the world in the US, filled with a bunch of sort of traditional safer sort of stocks or lower risk sort of stocks the nasdaq 100 full of sort of tech companies biotech uh that has been less <laughs> bitcoin has been less volatile than that over a five-day span and also the price of gold uh as well has been more volatile than bitcoin uh so this is very a very rare occurrence it's happened it has happened uh, sometimes previously uh but the, it did happen one of those rare times in late july so yeah, what does this all mean? It really, for exchanges, low volatility equates to very, very low volume because traders don't have any signal or any movement to sort of trade off of. They enjoy price action that's that's very volatile because it allows them to, you know, you know, draw all those lines on the charts that you might see and uh, you know, wait for prices to fill certain areas for them to execute on trades. So, the exchanges at the moment are sort of taking a hit. And yeah, it's sort of been a very quiet period. However, a lot of fundamental news that is very relevant for us as crypto investors. So looking forward to getting into that. So just last thing here in terms of, you know, just to you know demonstrate how, how sort of flat the prices have been. Bitcoin ETH, they're sort of, <laughs> Bitcoin at the moment is 0.1% lower over the past 24 hours. ETH is actually 0 0.00 plus minus, has not moved. And over the past seven days, Bitcoin's down 1.3% and ETH is down 1.9%. XRP, we saw that be a big winner uh, in recent months. That is down 13% notably in the last seven days. So not much to report on on the short-term price action side of things, Leon, but looking forward to getting into discussing some of the big events from the past seven days. Yeah, let's get right into it. But isn't it just weird to have Bitcoin and ETH not move that much and have the yeah, rest yeah. of the uh, That's right. Have the rest of the markets move. Bitcoin's supposed to be the volatile asset, right? Am I right, guys? Uh, but yeah, let, let's move on to the biggest one of the biggest news stories we have there, which Matt was alluding to before. So the SEC have now actually received a whole bunch of new ETF applications. But this time, guys, it's not for Bitcoin. It's for Ethereum. So Matt, take it away. What, what, what does this all mean, right? What's happening with these ETFs? Sure. We won't spend too much time on this. I know, you know a lot of the audience is probably sick of all this ETF talk. Uh, it's been going on for about 10 years in this industry to no avail, <laughs> at least in the US. However, notable at least to put it on your radar that last week there were a wave of ETF applications, as Leon just said, in relation to Ethereum. So we've been talking in... June, July, and into August now, all about Bitcoin ETFs. And there's a very increased probability that, you know, they are going to be passed, at least according to all the expert ETF analysts. However, we have not been talking about ETH at all. So what does an Ethereum ETF look like? There have been attempts to apply for one to the SEC previously, and they've denied them all. I think it's around 10 attempts or so. Bitcoin has had a lot more attempts and they have all failed to date. Uh, notably, this ETF for all 12 of these. So there were 12 last week that got applied. 
and all of them were in the design of a futures ETF, uh, as opposed to, you know, the spot, uh, you know, basing it on the spot uh, sort of price, uh, which we've talked about, you know, many times previously, why that distinction is very important. However, you typically see futures be the first of the two to be sort of uh, approved by the SEC, as we saw the case with the SEC approving the Bitcoin futures ETF, um, you know, in the past one to two years, but they are yet to approve the Bitcoin spot ETF. So yeah, I'm not going to name out all the names who applied for it. To really simplify it, one of them, one of them applied for an Ethereum futures ETF. And basically all of the other ETF issuers out there more or less have a saved version of a proposal in their hard, in their sort of shared workspace online. And they would have all basically just maybe changed a couple of minor details and then sent it into the SEC. So that's why you see such an immediate copycat reaction. It's essentially FOMO from the ETF issuers because the prize is so large for being among the first to be approved for a, an ETF into a new asset class. That's why we saw such a rush. So if I was to come here and say, you know, there was just one application versus there was 12 applications, really important to understand that there isn't really much of a meaning behind that, the difference in those numbers, if that makes sense. It's just the fact that, hey, one of them has at least thought, hmm, this might be a decent time to attempt this once again. And now you've seen a wave of copycats. So in terms of deadlines, we talk about ETF and deadlines a lot of the time. Um, that's how it could be because there's multiple of them. So the first deadline for this wave of new ETF applicants with respect to Ethereum futures, the first deadlines to worry, to be concerned about or to be aware of are around the middle of October. If history is anything to go by, the SEC will get towards that date and then they'll announce, hey, we need a bit more time here. And then they will extend it, you know, another, you know, two, three months. So that's probably going to be what happens in this respect. But uh, yeah, it was uh, surprising to see the ETF uh, conversation change, Leon, from all the focus on Bitcoin to now Ethereum just last week. That's right. It's so funny, isn't it? It's like all those school kids are trying to submit oh, yeah. their homework <laughs> and they're trying to like uh, copy the kid next to them and give it to the teacher. And like, hey, teacher, look at, our, look at my homework. It's much better. <laughs> yeah, that's how I think about it. But I, I, I've got a question for you there, Matt. So mm -hmm. um, I'm an Ethereum investor myself, and some of my friends are Ethereum investors as well. But so what does this actually mean? Is this news bullish for us? And uh, like, to what degree if a, a futures ETF actually does get approved? Is this good news? Yeah, it's a great question because, you know, just because a lot of headlines are talking about it, you can automatically, you know, think that it's super relevant for investors, you know, and a lot of people really don't even talk about, you know, what the implications are. So it's a good question for me. I would say an approval. Let's just have an example where the SEC does approve these. I would say a net result from that is that it is bullish ultimately for ETH, for ETH investors, because I would believe uh, it would add more, you know, why do I say that? I think it would add more validation and legitimacy to ETH itself. Some people would say that legitimacy isn't even necessary because it's through the eyes of you know, TradFi or traditional finance. However, reality is that is an extremely important uh, area of the world or the economy that, you know, in my opinion, needs to get exposure to crypto if it is going to go and become a very much larger market than what it currently is today. So yeah, to, to answer your question, I would say it would be slightly bullish for ETH overall. Uh, and also then if, if a spot ETH, Ethereum ETF were to get approved, uh, that would be the, the next step that would inevitably come. Then yep. that would, that would then itself be very bullish as well. So we're nowhere near that stage yet, but there's sort of degrees of bullishness and sort of steps in this process to sort of legitimize, legitimize ETH and, and make it part of the traditional financial world. Yeah. And I mean, oh, I just think about it. They've rejected so many other uh, ETF applications. So mm. really, what do we have to lose t unless uh, we're, we're bullish, right? That's, that's, mm. how, that's the way I think about it. Uh, so thanks for that update on the uh, ETF space, Matt. It is super complicated, but rest assured at Collective Shift, we do keep you on track. We think there's anything you need to know. Uh, we'll move on to the next big topic of the week, which I'm going to share my screen so you can see as well. This is regarding uh, base. Coinbase has released 
well, is just about to release the actual layer two blockchain. It's called Base, right? So we covered this last week. It's making the news round. It is a layer two on top of Ethereum. Basically, what that means is that it's faster and it's cheaper for you to use. It's mostly curated by Coinbase, it's a centralized entity. So you take that with a grain of salt if you think it's decentralized or not. Now, you can bridge there right now if you want. Already, there's about $118 million that's bridged over to the base protocol. Now, the interesting thing is there's only 8 million of that is actually USDC and 2 million of that is DAI. The rest of that, nearly 100 million, is Ethereum, native ETH. So that's very interesting, right? So to me, that kind of gives off the impression that people are just preparing to have ETH be used as the native gas token of the network. Well, we don't see any indications of a base layer two token, right? There is another base protocol, but don't get that mixed up, okay? There is another token called base, and that is not for the Coinbase actual <laughs> base layer two. Now, my question is, my second question, my friends, is what protocols are actually live on there right now? Let me show you my screen so you can see what I'm looking at. So this is the DeFi Llama page where we have a look at the base protocol. And this is there. And you can see right now the uh, total value locked is actually a little bit lower. So I think this is not quite accurate at this point in time. But you can see some of the protocols that are on there right now. Base Swap, Sushi Swap, Coconut, Balancer. All these are kind of well-known DEXs and protocols in DeFi. But my question, but my uh, uh, caution to you guys is make sure you know what you're getting yourself into. When you sign transactions on chain, make sure you're using the right one and make sure at least it's a dirty wallet, right? If you don't know what that is, check out the security center over at Collective Shift. Now, my last thing I want to cover for you guys in regards to base is there is actually a giant NFT mint happening for the Coinbase, uh, uh, for the base protocol. This is it on screen right now. You can mint this NFT when you bridge um, and you have 24 days to do this. Basically, it's a way for a part of you, it's a way for you to be a part of the community. It's a multi-week festival. They concentrate on on-chain art, music, gaming, and a whole bunch more. So feel free to go ahead and mint this if you want. It's just a little bit of fun, just to get you interacting, just to get you on the actual blockchain itself, right? The layer two solution so that you can experience it. And then when you're done, you can go back to Ethereum mainnet if you want. Um, yeah, so that's the, that's the base protocol itself. It's coming up soon. But uh, my question is, uh, Matt, I think, a lot of our viewers might be uh, wanting to know as well, why? Why do we even need another layer two solution? What makes the difference? Why is this, why is this any different than if Arbitrum or Optimism, right? What do you think? Uh, it's an excellent question uh, because really the, the, the experience or the, you know, the, the, the choice from a user's perspective once they're on Optimism or once they're on Base or once they're on Arbitrum 1, Arbitrum Nova, you're more or less doing the more or less the same yeah. activities and whatnot. Uh, so it's a great question to ask. My sort of um, place for area where I would come from when you know distinguishing base from all the others and sort of arguing why it is necessary would be that just sort of Coinbase like be behind is behind the actual L2 itself, uh, which is again some people might not like that from a decentralization standpoint. They do have plans to decentralize it. But some people, you know, aren't happy with where it is at, at the moment. Um, however, I think this is again sort of like what I was saying with the traditional finance aspect of things. I think it is a necessary step uh, to sort of help crypto expand to the masses. I know Base and Coinbase, uh, the Coinbase developers are very experienced when it comes to user user experience and knowing what what people want out of crypto. They do a ton of work on on all of that side of things. And also, I think with their user base, which uh, is over 100 million verified users, not sure how many of them are, are active these days, but it's still a, a large net of potential users where they can softly market to. Um, you know, they can be like, hey, here's $5 worth of USDC ready to go That's in, right. your, in your base address if you, if you bridge across and they can make that super easy to their exchange users. Uh, so examples like that, where I think, you know, base does justify standing on its own sort of in its own area in the optimism ecosystem. Um, but yeah, that would be my answer to that. I think for many of you, you know, just who are overwhelmed and just, you know, can't see the point of all these L2 solutions. 
uh, do know that this is going to continue. There's there's already dozens of them, and there will be hundreds very soon, and then eventually thousands of L twos and and sort of uh, you know what are called layer threes or or little chains built, built on top of L twos. So this is like the direction we're going. Many of them will fail, just like all the cryptocurrencies today. But all this competition, Leon, uh, sort of breeds innovation and ultimately more competition equals better for the users like people listening to this right now so that's sort of you know what we what we want we don't just want one chain sort of dominating because yeah again the, their incentives to develop innovate would be less compared to a situation like this so yeah very exciting and it's been one of the more talked about and i guess anticipated project launches of 2023 so far so yeah it's a, it's a exciting time in the space well said, man. Well said. And I think innovation uh, is going to be coming in this space because when you want to go out to a restaurant and eat f some food, you don't just want to have Mexican. You want to have Thai. You want to have Vietnamese. You want to have Chinese, everything else. So it's good to have mm. a good selection in the marketplace, right? Um, but uh, let's let's go on to our next biggest topic of the week, Matt. So we had a new report that came out regarding Bitcoin's environmental benefits. It was actually quite an interesting read. I know you did uh, uh, go through it. So uh, give us your thoughts. What did you think about this while I share the screen so our users can see what we're talking about? Yeah, sure. We'll link to this below in the in the show notes for Collective Shift members as well. Uh, but really, you've got KPMG here. So one of the sort of big four professional services you know, uh, firms out there do a lot of consulting work and in other areas. Really, they did a report on Bitcoin's uh, role in the ESG imperative. So what are its sort of environmental aspects of Bitcoin? Is it is it a pro? Is it a, uh, is it a net benefit or a net sort of cost to this ESG movement? Um, and this, this movement towards a more environmentally friendly world that we're clearly going in that direction. Uh, and look, you, I, I would have had to, uh, you would have been able to shock me a lot if you told me that this was going to happen like a couple of years ago. Uh, I would not have believed you if you told me that someone like KPMG is reporting on overall sort of the bitcoin the benefits that bitcoin can bring to this this esg movement uh if you scroll down right to the bottom leon they do have their conclusion there they go into quite it's a very well sort of research you can tell that the authors have uh really taken time to understand uh how the bitcoin network fundamentally works and its impact on the environment which is a uh notoriously sort of misunderstood area due to its sort of the complexity of how the invite the energy market sort of works it's certainly not an area i have expertise in but i know enough to know that it's widely uh misunderstood in relation to bitcoin you know it's always uh sort of criticized for its significant energy use however as kpmg point out the primary issue here isn't about it's the amount of energy that it's used it's about where that energy is sourced from and in that respect, they sort of had some good things to say about, you know, the financial incentive of miners, Bitcoin miners who help secure the Bitcoin blockchain and are rewarded in the form of Bitcoin, the currency for their work. Uh, you know, KPMG points out that they are financially incentivized to look for the cheapest source of energy, which in many parts of the world is fast becoming renewables. Uh, so yeah. again, sort of that, that feedback loop and in their conclusion here, which we do have up on the screen, you know, they, they acknowledge that Bitcoin appears to provide a number of benefits across an ASG framework throughout Bitcoin's short history, new and innovative ways of le leveraging the Bitcoin network and its native asset, which is also called Bitcoin, continue to emerge, such as helping to stabilize energy grids, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and even assist with providing sustainable heat and commercial uh, to commercial and residential properties. So again, we'll link to this, you know, very, it's a very punchy, succinct 12 page report, which again, it doesn't ramble on, which is what I love these, love these sort of advisory reports. You typically to the point. see them repeating themselves, but it's very to the point. Uh, and yeah, encourage anyone interested to get an accurate sort of reflection of where Bitcoin stands at the moment in return. So it's environmental impact, really great report. So uh, very pleased to see that. And it's, I suppose the take takeaway here is that it's sort of 
change you can it's more proof i think that you know the world the society at large is sort of starting to understand the nuances of you know the bitcoin network and how it impacts uh, like more broadly the environment uh so yeah very pleased to see this uh, Matt, mate, I, I just love having you on the team because you can explain things in, in such a succinct way for us to understand. And I w- want to say thank you for reading the article, that, uh, reading the report and giving us an update on that. I, it's, it's just amazing. This is the sort of things we do at Collective Shift for our members here. We save you time. You don't have to read the report. We're going to summarize the whole thing for you. Um, thanks, Matt. Uh, <laughs> so, so, Matt, let's move on to the next part of uh, the segment of the show where we talk about what we're actually looking forward to in the next week, right? So, Matt, I think you go first. What are you looking forward to next week, man? Yeah, I've already already covered it, but you know, I'm not going to try to find another answer because I really want to. I really want to emphasize the importance of what is happening this week, which is, of course, the launch of Base. Uh, so it's launching on. Net. It is available technically on mainnet already for developers, and as Leon touched on, you can bridge over there, but you cannot do anything at least in a very user-friendly way you can you know get into the contracts and whatnot at the moment and do that now but they're really they're going to be cutting the ribbon more or less on on uh, on august the 9th and, and opening it up and yeah really want to yeah really give that the attention it deserves uh and it's going to be a very exciting well month ahead really for for the crypto market and crypto ecosystem starting with basis launch on on august the 9th which Personally, I expect them to have a few aces up their sleeve and to sort of, you know, make some complimentary announcements around that date. I think you know, so. Jury's out. We'll, we'll probably cover that next week and see yep. if that was true. But that's what I would be expecting from this week. Yeah, that's right. I, I generally think so too, mate. They want to save a few aces mm. up their sleeve just to, you know, drum up a little bit of news for them. Um, so what I'm looking forward to as, is actually not just next week, but it's actually for the rest of the month. I'm looking forward to Collective Shifts member Q&A. We do this every month, guys. This is the best place for you to get all of your crypto answers, uh, all of your crypto questions answered by the Collective Shift team, a whole bunch of analysts uh, looking at crypto specifically for you. So if you have any questions, even right now, if you have a question about crypto, you've got a question about base layer two solution, anything at all, make sure you leave it in the comment section down below. Better yet, become a member and come on to the member Q&A where we answer everything you need to know. How's that sound, Matt? I think uh, I'm going to enjoy next month's uh, member Q&A. Yeah, it's always always great fun. And yeah, coming in with the live questions, then question for people who can't join live as well. It's I like to uh, get through both types of questions. It's always a good environment in, in the chat. So yeah, had fun last week and looking forward to the next one. Oh, awesome, man. Yeah, I'll see you there. <laughs> now, 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 Matt, uh, let's go on to the last segment where we look at uh, something that is either overappreciated or underappreciated in the market right now. What did you think uh, was last week that uh, wasn't uh, appreciated at all? Yeah, this, uh, again, an, uh, so another one that sort of uh, surprised me uh, that I did see a few days ago was that uh, another all-time high for Bitcoin when you're talking about uh, it's long-term holder supply. So, you know, how many entities, you know, people are out there that have held Bitcoin for over a year and that Bitcoin hasn't even, hasn't moved around. Uh, that is, that number of people is, is now up to, I suppose, the, the amount of Bitcoin that that is, I suppose that long-term holder base is, is accountable for. It's, it's all of a sudden crept up to 14.59 million Bitcoin. We know today that there's about 19.5 Bitcoin in circulation, wow. maximum supply being 21 million, of course. So really, we're talking about 75% of the circulating supply is currently held by, it's current, 75% of the Bitcoin currently in circulation has not moved in more than a year, which is, uh, again, a, a new all-time high for Bitcoin in its you know, 13 years or so of existence, a bit longer than that now. Uh, so yeah, it was another sort of, as investors, we get you know, excited when we see things like this, because it's more people who are just adding to their, to their balances of Bitcoin slowly, but surely, and, uh, are like wanting to help hold it for the long term. So that was an exciting little stat I saw the other day. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Thanks so much for sharing that. Uh, it just confounds me that yes, the huge amount of circulating supply is like not even touched for one whole mm. year. A lot of people love it. They don't want to touch it. They're keeping it for the long, long term. I love seeing that, especially in an asset like Bitcoin. That's pretty good, mm. man. That's awesome. 
um, what I wanted to share was that uh, I found out that uh, you can actually be earning about 8% on your DAI, which is a stable coin. So 8% is a pretty good rate. Right now, it's called the DAI savings rate, the DSR. It is subject to change because of MakerDAO's governance vote. So it could be, you know, changing in the near future. So don't take it as your piggy bank. I just thought it was something super interesting because your bank account now with your mortgage probably gives you 5%, 6%. But now a stable coin gives you 8%, which is pretty crazy. But always keep in mind, what are the risks associated with this interest rate? What are they doing to your coins to actually give you 8%, right? That's the question you need to be asking. Nothing is free, my friends. And that's a wrap for this week. We're going to end it there. If you're looking for more insights, make sure you see our weekly revamped Collective Shift newsletter providing free market insights every Friday. Make sure you subscribe at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. We'll see you very soon, my friends.